Well, good morning, Renew Life Church. This is the day so many of you have been waiting for. Uh, you have just enjoyed live worship. Some of you have just enjoyed live worship. Uh, you're in the room with us right now. Welcome. Welcome to church. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, welcome. Uh, one of the reasons we're filming this service is so that you got the exact same experience uh, that those that chose to join us live this morning did. And so we hope you enjoyed the worship set. I actually this week got to be a part of the recording. It was incredible. And so I hope you enjoyed the worship and, of course, the live worship. If, you were, if you're in the room with us right now, uh, you already know how good it was. So, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I'm going to be really honest. This is a very unique season. One, we're doing, uh, it's the first time we've ever done this. It's the first time I've ever recorded a message, a preaching message uh, for our Sunday morning service. So that in and of itself is new. Uh, we've been doing this, obviously, for uh, quite some time. In fact, if I know myself, I'm actually nowhere near the sanctuary right now live because the thought of watching me talk to you live is probably more than I can stand. So I'm probably hiding out in one of the children's classrooms right now. Uh, but this is very unique. And so, uh, again, just, just welcome. We're glad that you're here. Obviously, as a country, we are in one of the most unique, incredible seasons we've ever been in, maybe in, in, in my lifetime, in some of, most of your lifetimes, I guess I should say, and potentially even in uh, what could be the rest of our lifetime. Uh, I, I'm going to jump right in and just say uh, it would be poor leadership on my part, uh, even though this is our first Sunday back, and I'd love to be talking about a whole lot of other things and just encouraging and celebrating. That's what I wished I was doing. Uh, right now, but I, I, I wouldn't be the leader that I'm supposed to be uh, if I didn't take some time to acknowledge what's going on in our country and speak to this as honestly and as candidly as I can. I think it would be really easy for some to think that what we're dealing with has never been seen before, that uh, particularly the racism that we're seeing, the, the, the racial tension that we're seeing, uh, we have never seen anything like this before. Uh, I hope that by the end of this this message today, you'll see this is not new. Uh, unfortunately, this is not new. Uh, and I will just give you the end from the beginning. God's response is not new. Uh, the same way he's responded to injustice in the past is the same, day, same way he wants to respond to injustice right now. And uh, I, I just want to begin by saying, uh, in the, when all of this started, uh, this most recent situation with George Floyd, um, one, I'm not a big social media guy. I'm, not hardly, I'm never on social media, hardly ever on social media, unless it's to show you one of the animals that I've killed. But um, I'm, I'm rarely on social media. And uh, when, when things were happening, as things were happening, I just, I couldn't, I, I made a post, I made one post because I just couldn't not. But after that, I just, as I continued to seek the Lord on, on what to do as a leader, how to respond, what to do, let me, let me un unsay that if I can. What to do as a person, what to do, what to do as a human being, and what to do as a Jesus follower. Uh, it just didn't feel like enough, and I just, I really spent a lot of time in prayer saying, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me do as a person? What would you have me do as a Jesus follower? Uh, what would you have me do as a white man? What would you have me do as a church leader? And uh, I woke up one morning in pr after prayer, it, one morning, I just knew, I heard the Lord speak to me in the shower, actually, he just said, do something. Uh, and he reminded me that the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. And I have done some things. I am, however, convinced that I have not done all of the things that I could have done, and that it's imperative that right now me and everyone listening, whether that's live in the sanctuary at the Cole Theater right now or online, uh, there is a mandate from God right now to do something. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, I've asked a few of my friends, some of my black American friends, to join me on July the 11th at 7 p.m. for a, a live discussion. And uh, I'll just give you a heads up. I, I, I've never done anything like this before, but I, I want to give the, the floor to some people that I trust, some black Americans and friends of mine that I trust, that I know them, and that any other time in history, if they had talked to me about their expertise in, in law or government or uh, the church, because some of the people I'm inviting, some are, some are in L.A., some are in Baltimore, some are the East Coast, West Coast, some are, some are young, some are older, some are male, some are female, some are in ministry, some are doctors, some are teachers, some are coaches. Uh, there's a range of people that I'm going to be asking, and, it, and I, what, I, what I know to be true of any other time in history, any other time in my life, 
we could have a conversation about any other area of expertise with them. And if they told me something, I would just believe them. If they told me this is how you coach, here's what's going on in politics, here's some, 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 some facts about medicine, here's some things I've learned in Scripture about ministry. As human beings, I would believe them. And, and I'm going to share a bit of my journey as well, that this is not the first time I've done this, but I'm going to ask them some questions. I'm going to ask them how they feel. I'm going to get their perspective. I'm not going to give them my perspective. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to pose some questions. And then I'm going to do something and encourage you to do the same. I'm going to believe them. I'm going to believe them. Sounds so simple. Have another human being that you trust and love tell you something, and you just believe them. You don't make excuses. You don't try to convince them that what they think is real is not real. You give them the decency to let them talk. Treat them like another human being of equal value, of equal intelligence, of equal spiritual capacity, and you just believe them. And that's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to let some friends of mine talk. And I'm going to believe them. And I'm going to ask you to do the same. It's July, I'm sorry, June 11th, 7 p.m. It's going to be a Zoom call that we're going to stream live to Facebook. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my story because, again, this, what I'm encouraging us as a church to do right now, what I'm encouraging you as a person to do right now is not something new for me personally. This is not to give myself a pat on the back. It's just to tell you my story And I believe that my story has given me the confidence to lead in this season and to tell you what I'm telling you right now and and to say it with confidence, to say it with conviction, and to say it with faith that there's a piece of my journey that I've seen produce fruit, not just in my own life, but in my relationships with people of a different race, of a different color. I, uh, I grew up in a really small town in West Texas, and uh, I, I didn't even know I didn't even know really what racism was. I mean, obviously, if you can say, hey, what's the definition of it? I could have given you a definition. But it was, it was not real. It was not something that we talked about. It was n- the pain. I had no concept of the pain of it. I had no awareness of the pain of it. And uh, I did know that uh, one color or, or one color or some colors of people, they lived across the tracks that's what we used to say. They live across the tracks. We live on this side of the tracks. Didn't, didn't think much of it. I remember in junior high, uh, a, a scuffle broke out in the lunchroom. And, and I'll just say it. It was the, the blacks and the Mexicans versus the white. And we were going to have us a little fight. And, it, and what was funny about it is I remember it happening. And we, we left the lunchroom. We all planned the fight. And I remember we even got like licorice super rope things as if that's a real weapon. And we, we left the lunchroom, and we were going to circle the, the junior high building, and we were going to meet in the front, and we were going to fight it out. It was going to be the blacks and the Mexicans versus the white. And we were so far removed from so much and so ignorant of so much, it wasn't even real. We didn't even realize that we were playing some game that was not funny. And I remember the, the, the police officer that, that, that patrolled the junior high when he saw what was happening, next thing you know, all of us were lined up, spread eagle against the lockers. He was frisking us and because people had grabbed rocks and sticks and different things. But if I'm just being honest with you, it wasn't real. It wasn't what you're watching today on TV. It was young, small town, ignorant, white, Mexican, and black boys had, that had no idea that we were entertaining a narrative that for us seemed a bit like a joke. Let me rephrase that. For me, it seemed a bit like a joke. I'm coming to understand it was probably not as near as much of a joke for some other people. It was a joke for me because I had never felt the pain of the reality of it. It could be a joke for me. It could be a super rope fight when little did I know what possibly was going on in the hearts and the minds of maybe the other side. I'll say it, the other side of the tracks. So I I grew up in in a very... Uh, ignorant way, personally. I'm not blaming anyone for it. I'm not blam- obviously not blaming my parents or anybody else. Uh, obviously, it was environmental to some, to some extent. But I remember growing up with just doing stupid things. I had a Confederate flag wallet. I had a Confederate flag sticker on the back of my truck, just ignorant. And 
uh, I had so many preconceived notions in my own mind uh, about the way things were, such a small worldview too. And I remember going to college and coming to Midland Junior College for the first time, and I remember meeting some black Americans from all over the country, all over the world, even from other countries. And uh, all of a sudden, I began to see the diversity that there were, there were, there were black Americans from my, my hometown, but there were other black Americans from other cities that had different experiences, that looked different, that sounded different. And for the first time in my life, I was like, wait a minute, I've, I've been thinking wrong. I've been believing wrong. There's something wrong in my heart. I have ignored a reality I've, I've pushed aside this reality that I could be racist or that racism could be wrong or even telling a, a little joke could be wrong, having a Confederate flag wallet could be wrong, or it could be insensitive at best. And, I, and, and the, God began to do a work in my heart. Uh, years of college, I remember having some black friends in college. Uh, I'll never forget a guy, we called him Midnight Love on BET. There used to be a show called Midnight Love. And every night when I got back into the dorm room, midnight was at the, at the middle of the dorm room in the commons area on TV. He didn't have a TV in his own room. He's watching Midnight Love on BET. And so we'd always joke back and forth. He ended up playing in the NBA. And so we called him Midnight because that's what he was always watching was Midnight Love. And so a rapport began to develop and a respect and an honor. And I felt things, wrong mindsets began to be removed from me. Like Just like the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I could feel a transformation happening in me, in my emotions, in my thought processes. I could tell I was changing the way I thought about a people group. And uh, as things continued, I ended up going to uh, Athens, Tennessee, to a college, Tennessee Wesleyan College, to continue my baseball career. And uh, many of you know that in that season, my wife, uh, her entire family died in a plane crash. And so it was an incredibly difficult time for us. I just got married, been married three weeks. Uh, her family dies in a plane crash. We moved to Tennessee, and we are in one of the most difficult seasons of our life. And uh, we were going to an incredible church at the time in Cleveland, Tennessee. And uh, Leanne began to work out a lot. Just it was, I think it was a bit of a stress relief for her and just a way to escape the pain of what she was going through. And so when I went back for my junior year, uh, we, uh, our junior season, she began working out a lot. And I remember her coming home from from school or or from uh, working out one day. I came home from school and she had been to the gym and she said those words that every uh, new husband wants to hear. She said, hey, uh, I met a guy at the gym today. (laughs) And so it was kind of an interesting way to start a conversation. But I remember her saying, hey, I I know that sounds crazy, but I met this guy at the gym. And she begins to tell me the story about uh, this guy who actually had worked at the gym at the time and had saw her running on the treadmill. Of course, I joke now, his name's John. I won't tell you his last name, but if he's watching, but John, I remember telling the story, he said he looked at Leanne running on the treadmill, and he was like, Lord Jesus, you done brought me my woman, that is exactly what I've been praying for, and so we kind of joked about that, but uh, long story short, of course, Leanne's right off the bat, said, oh yeah, me and my husband are here, and uh, a conversation began, and somehow church came up, and he invited us to go to church, and at the time, we were incredibly happy with our church. In fact, our incredible pastors there in Cleveland had walked us through. They were there. Actually, they were there with us when we found out that Leanne's family had been found after 13 days of search and rescue. They were with us. We had just picked us up from the airport uh, and, and, and were with us when we found out that they had found her family. And so they too had walked us through some of those incredibly difficult times. And so we were super happy with where we were in church, but it just felt as though God was doing something. And um, Long story short, we, he said, I want, you to come, I want you to come to my church. And so I, I did, and this was far, far beyond the days or before the days of, long before the days of asking Siri, hey, Google, Overcoming Faith Christian Center Church in Athens, Tennessee, and doing some research and seeing how many reviews it got and all that. I was like, hey, man, God invited us to church. Let's just go. So we got the address, and I'll never forget that first morning we, we drove up. It was that kind of almost out in, in the, it seemed like in the country. We got across the creek. I went the wrong way at first, and it's off the beaten track, off the beaten path. And, and I remember pulling in uh, and looking off to the side, and I was like, this cannot be the church. It was one of those old school red brick, a hundred steps up to the front door kind of thing. At least that's how it f- felt in my mind with big high ceiling, you know, the old churches that were about that wide and that long. And, um, little church, small church, and there was not a white person in sight. And 
I, as I looked at it, I told him, I was like, oh, this is, this is, we're in the wrong place. This is not the church we're supposed to be going to. And before we could change our mind, a guy steps out into the street. And it was one of those, stri- it was one of those situations where, like, if you're even on that street on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., the only reason you'd be there is to go to that church because there wasn't nothing else. And so the guy steps out in the street and waves us into the parking lot. And I remember kind of nervously turning to Leanne and saying, well, looks like this is where we're going to church today. And uh, so we... Um, we pull into the parking lot, and I was actually telling a, a friend of mine this story just a few minutes ago, and I remember getting out of, the, of our vehicle, and again, not a white person in sight, and I got out of the vehicle, and we were greeted, got to the front door, and by the time we got to the front door, I knew that this was my family. I knew that God had brought us here. I knew that we were supposed to be there. I could feel the presence of God on the moment. That this was right. This is right where I'm supposed to be at this very moment. This is right who I'm supposed to be here with in this very moment. For the next almost two years, we were pastored by Pastor Harold McCowan, uh, one of my, what I consider one of my spiritual fathers, who walked us through, again, one of the most difficult seasons of our life. And and when I say walked us through, it wasn't like we were over at his house all the time and we were sharing our feelings and thoughts like that. No, he, he walked us through by how he led the church, how he showed up every Sunday and he preached the goodness of God. He preached faith and he kept us built up and he gave us a place to belong, welcomed us into their family. And, uh, and I just remember, even at that time, I would have not ever believed that or even thought that I had racial thoughts or tendencies. I mean, they were my family. Uh, but I just noticed the Lord began to continue to work on things. And I remember going, I remember there came a Sunday uh, several, several months into attending that I dressed a certain way. I, again, we were one of the only couple white people in this, in this church, small church. But I remember at one point I dressed the way I dressed, but they, they dressed a little fancier than I dressed. And I just remember... this desire to honor them. And honor the leadership of the church, and honor the pastor of the church, and honor the culture of the people. And I remember telling Leanne, I got to get me some silky slacks. I mean, like, that's what you got to do, apparently, to roll with these folks. You got to get you some, some baggy, silky slacks. And so I remember going to the Chattanooga Mall and bought me some nice silky slacks and some nice dress shirts. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't a put on. It wasn't forced upon me. It wasn't a put on. It was a genuine honor for the people I was with. I didn't go, I didn't, I can say this for sure. I hear people say this. Let me say it a different way. I hear people say this. I don't see color. Yes, you do. And to act as though the pinnacle of God's plan for humanity is that we don't see color is ignorance. It's not that we don't see color. It's that we see color and still honor. It's that we see difference and we still respect and we still love. And that one culture's way of doing things does not make them superior or inferior to another group of people. And I just felt this love for this group of people and this family and this church began to grow in me. And uh, they took us in like family. I remember years later, we showed up to a New Year's Eve service, and uh, Pastor McCown, we, we just snuck in there, and it was the middle of a New Year's Eve. Uh, we, I knew they were going to be worshiping all night long. That's what they do. And uh, Pastor McCown, called, we walked in, and we, we didn't tell anybody we were coming. And he saw Leanne in the back, and he said, tell my, he stopped the service, and he said, tell my daughter to come up here. And so she, called me in upon stage and she sang the song that was only revert, held for her and uh, they were family we thought they were our family they thought I were our family no we knew that they were our family they knew that we were their family and this work in us just continued to grow and continued to happen and uh, they were so faithful and they were just such good people and um you know, we ended up leaving Tennessee, coming back from Texas, and there's a bit of a span of history there where um, I'm just leading in the church and, and, and holding different church jobs and 
I lived in Midland for a little bit, moved to Amarillo for a little bit, ended up coming back to Midland. And I, I'm fast forwarding because I want to get to the next season of life. That season, the Lord taught me a lot about just ministry in general. And I had great spiritual fathers who, who led and guided me in, in a whole other way. And, um, and so there was a bit of season there where I, I felt a bit removed from those, those situations, those seasons. And, uh, but then in September of 2016, something happened that it's like it started another season for me. Uh, another season of growth, another season of development. And uh, in September of 20, uh, 2016, the, uh, a man by the name of Terrence Crutcher was shot in Tulsa, Oklahoma by a female police officer. And again, that was only three or four years ago. And uh, he was shot. And again, I was, I was pastoring this church. I was pastoring Renew Life Church. And for the first time, at least the first time that I was aware of what was happening for the first time, I realized that I, I have a responsibility not just for myself, but I have a responsibility to lead a group of people through a very tense situation. And it was all over the national news. Uh, the officer ended up getting arrested. Then she was later uh, found not guilty uh, of murder. And so, uh, but it was a very, a very tough situation. And, and I just remember at that moment, I, had, I, was a lot, I was very confused as a leader, very confused as to how to lead other people through this. I was even confused as to what I thought. Do I think that black lives matter? Do I think that blue lives matter? Do I think that all lives matter? You guys may remember when some of this was being born, and I didn't know which side was the side of right. I didn't, I didn't want to be the—I just that's, that's kind of the way I'm wired. I just want to be on the side of right. When I meet my creator— even especially in situations like this and days like this, I want to I want to be able to look back at him and say, "Hey, in that situation, you were on the right side. You were on the right side." And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be on the right side, and and I just remembered thinking, "I'll never know, I'll never know what the the black community thinks. I'll, I'll I'm not one. I'll never know. I'll never be able to empathize with them. I I need to ask questions, listen." And just believe. And I remember having a conversation. I called a friend of mine while I was in Los Angeles. And I said, hey, I need to have a conversation with you. And uh, it was just me. He's a, he's, he's a young black man, an incredible man named Maurice. And I, and I sat down with him. He was the first guy that I've ever done this with. And I said, Maurice, we sat down for breakfast in downtown Los Angeles. And I said, hey, I need to ask you some really hard questions. And I, just, I need you to be really honest with me. But I need, you to, I need to know what is, what is this? What is going on? All this racial tension. What, what do you feel? What, what do I not know as a white man, a white privileged man? What do I not know that I need to know? I, I'm confused. And, and I remember Maurice was so gracious in walking me through, you know, his dad being a police officer and, and different things he dealt with as a young black man. And I just remember he sat there and poured his heart out to me. And I just listened and I just believed him. And listening and believing began to do a work in my heart. And I remember going back to the hotel room and telling Ian, I just had one of the most incredible conversations in my, in my life. I'll never forget this conversation. This conversation shaped my life. And I did the best I could to reiterate what Maurice had taught me and, and, and showed me and what he had said. And um, it was just an incredible moment for me. Fast forward uh, to 2017. Uh, actually, that conversation with Maurice, that was a, almost a year later. It was September 2017 when I had that conversation with him one year after the Terrence Crutcher incident. And uh, another year, year and a half later in 2019, February of 2019, uh, I ended up having another conversation, same sim situation. A lot of racial tension was happening in our country. And I had another friend of mine, and we were in, in California again. And I just said, hey, uh, tell me what I don't know. Tell me what, and this time Leanne was with me, and uh, Charlie was his name. In fact, both of the guys I just mentioned, Maurice and Charlie, they're going to be on the, the live Zoom call uh, July the, or June the 11th here in just a, a couple of days. So I encourage you to be on that call so that you can meet these guys that helped me so much. And I, I just asked Charlie some of the same questions. And Charlie, he's such a historian. He began to tell me, he's from Baltimore, he began to tell me the history and the, and the deep-seated uh, segregation and the systematic injustice, because that, that was a phrase that's still going around, and some white people, we don't want to hear that. Something about hearing systematic racism or white privilege, it feels like an attack against us. And we don't have enough humility to say, what if there is? What if there is systematic injustice? 
What if there's something ingrained in the fabric of our country that's not good? As, what, if there, what, what possibly, is it, is it even possible that our forefathers weren't perfect? That they founded this country. Yeah, they founded this country on religious freedom. They also founded this country on a lot of other things. Is it possible that the foundations of this country are not perfect? Is it possible that systematic injustice exists? And, man, he just, Charlie sat there and, and, and talked to Leanne and I. And I just remember Leanne and I just weeping there at breakfast just as we learned things that it's probably the norm for some people. It's the norm for black America. It was foreign to me. It was foreign to this white country boy from West Texas. It was foreign to us. And we sat there, and I, it was another moment in time where I remember my mind is being renewed. I am not being conformed to this world. I'm not being conformed to my West Texas roots. I am being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Truth, it was cleansing my mind of things. And um, we left. I remember leaving and just saying, Charlie, he, he shared something with me that I won't go into detail, but I told him, and I, I still plan on doing this. I said, Charlie, we got to write a book together. I want to write a book on this. this. This analogy that you just shared with me, it'll change my life. It'll change the world. It'll change children. And um, so it, it was another one of, those, one of those situations that just marked me. And that's a big part of the reason why I want to have this conversation on June the 11th. I want to invite you on the, this journey that changed my life so much. But I don't want to ignore that in Scripture, we've been here before. Humanity has been here before. And it's imperative that we allow God to show us what he once did so that we will know what he wants to do now. In Exodus chapter 2, uh, a story you guys know well, this is the story of Moses and the oppression of the Israelites under the hands of the Egyptians. And uh, this, is, this is right on the backside of the story of Joseph. You know, Joseph uh, who had the, uh, the, the incredible journey, but then he had the, the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream that there's going to be seven good years followed by seven bad years. And he interpreted the dreams, and basically Egypt was saved because of the dream of Joseph. And after everything happened the way that it did, Pharaoh e elevated Joseph to this incredibly high position. And uh, when we, where we pick up Scripture here in, in Exodus, those days have come and gone. Joseph has died. All of his brothers is, have died. And the Pharaoh that had elevated Joseph to this position is gone. And it says that the new Pharaoh, the Pharaoh that had come, had forgotten about Joseph. He didn't know about all that Joseph had done. So all you have is all of Joseph's descendants, all of his, all of his people, all the children of Israel. And uh, they began to grow. It says they began to grow. They grew very powerful. And the new Pharaoh saw that they were growing in power. And in fear, and in an effort to maintain control, he enslaved them. So the Egyptians, who, were once, who, who owed their lives to the Israelites are now enslaving the Israelites to maintain power, to maintain control. Moses is born in this time period. Moses is born into the time when, as a, as in an effort to maintain control, and he's enslaved and forcing him into slave labor, but as another extra method to maintain control, this Pharaoh is having all the, the male children of the Israelites thrown into the river. He couldn't convince the midwives to kill them when they were born. The, the midwives had too much fear, from, fear of God to do it. So he said, I'll just take, go to the next level. Let's just throw them in the river. So you've got a group of people who are oppressed in slavery, and now their male children are being thrown into the river so as, not, so as, they, so as to ensure that they cannot continue to increase in power. Moses is born into this. And Moses' mother says, I can't just throw him into the river. So she puts him in a basket, puts him in the river. Scripture says that his sister, Moses' sister, watches as Moses floats down the river to see what's going to happen. And someone from the palace sees Moses. And she just cannot. She goes, oh my gosh, this must be one of the Hebrew children. In other words, oh, this must be one of the Hebrew children that we're trying to kill. But something in her said, I just, I just can't do it. I can't kill him. And the sister, how genius is this and how faithful is God? The sister runs and sees that this is happening and says, oh, my gosh, why don't you let me go fetch a Hebrew woman to, raise, to, to nurse this baby? She goes, great idea. So she literally goes and gets, the sister goes and gets her mother, Moses' own mom, and Moses' own mom gets to raise him. And, oh, by the way, they said, hey, I'll pay you to nurse this baby. So she gets paid. This slave woman now has a job raising Moses, raising Someone born into slavery who's now going to be raised in royalty. 
as the story goes uh, in, 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 um, in, in Exodus chapter, ch- chapter 2, Moses grew up. Moses grew up knowing that he was not one of the Egyptians. He knew he was a Hebrew. But this is what it says in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren, and he looked at their burdens. He looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brothers. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that no one was around, he killed the Egyptian, and he hid him in the sand. Moses goes out. Moses is a grown man. He goes out and he sees one of his people. And he sees one of his people being beaten. He sees one of his people being mistreated. He sees the, the effects of slavery with one of his people. And he has a reaction. Kills him. Now, Moses did... Moses' action. Let me say it a different way. Moses' actions were two things. Moses' actions were understandable and inexcusable at the same time. Moses' actions were understandable because, oh my gosh, you're throwing our babies into the river. I'm barely here because you force us to throw our babies into the river. You've enslaved us. We saved you, and now you've enslaved us. So it would be under. Oh, and oh, and by the way, now I have to watch you beat one of my people, beat and, and, and tear down one of my people. It's easy to look at that and go, oh, hey, that's understandable. I'd be, I'd be ticked too. How many, how many of us hu- uh, fathers, how many of us husbands and fathers have sat around and said this? If anyone were to ever hurt one of my kids, and then we list all the laws that we would break if someone were to ever hurt one of our kids. And you know what? Doesn't even phase us. We go, totally understandable. We, we even know the things we're saying we would do are wrong. But we also know that the thing that was done was so much more wrong, it just might be understood why someone would do that. So what Moses did was understandable. But what Moses did was inexcusable. He murdered. He murdered. He killed. So you see that, yeah, I can look at what you're, see, what you're dealing with. I can see what your people are going through. Yet in the same way, I can say that's still not the way to handle it. You still don't just get to kill people. You don't get to get so mad that you do this. The Bible is clear. As Christians, white, black, rich, poor, male, female, we don't live by a constitution. I'm glad that we have a constitution in our country. But as Jesus followers, we live by the principles of the kingdom. We live by the word of God. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. So it tells us, I don't care how incredible the emotion is, you still have a boundary, and that boundary is the scripture. Moses' did, Moses' action were two things. They were understandable and inexcusable at the same time. Now, here's what's funny to me. It's funny that as long as I keep saying it's Israelites and Egyptians, it's easy to see both sides. So easy to see both sides when we say it was the Israelites were being oppressed by the Egyptians, and the Egyptians were trying to maintain control, doing all these terrible things, and the Israelites just wanted their freedom. And, and so one Israelite saw what was happening, what one Egyptian was doing to one of his brothers. So this Israelite killed this Egyptian. Isn't it interesting how easy it is to look at this with eyes wide open and go, you know what? I kind of see both sides. I kind of see both. I see what Moses was thinking, but I kind of see what, I, I kind of see the reality of, hey, you can't be going around killing people. Why is it so hard to see both sides right now? It's, it's, it's interesting how easy it is to see both sides when you're so far removed. And I propose that the only way we're going to see both sides is to get right back, right in the middle of what's going on today. And to have the conversations that we don't want to have. Say the things we don't want to have. Some of you have already ticked off. Some of you, you either turned this off, you've either walked out of the sanctuary, you can't believe I'm saying this word, you can't believe I'm not saying this word, you're still trying to figure out, well, is he all lives matter, black lives matter, blue? what lives matter to him the most right now? I'm fully aware that right now I'm singing the praises or, or someone's going to hear what I'm saying, they're singing my praises. And, the same, and in the same words I'm using are making some people say, you know what, I ain't my pastor no more. I can handle it, I promise you. Um, we've got to be willing to get right in the middle of this conversation. Be willing to say some things wrong. Use some terms. I, I used the term with a, a, a black man today. I said African-American. He said, hey, I'd, pr- I'd prefer you use black American. And then, you know what I said? I didn't say, well, I, I was just trying to help. No, you know what I said? Yes, sir. And if you'll notice, on the, for the remain, ever since I've started today, 
I use that phrase. I'm willing, I'm willing to get in conversations that make me uncomfortable. Are you willing to get in conversations that make you uncomfortable? Are you willing to let some things, again, it's easy to say when it's Israelites and Egyptians. What about when it's black and white? What about when it's male and female? I want to continue with the story because I want to wrap up. Uh, I don't want to go too long, but Pharaoh does find out what Moses has done. Moses goes back the next day and he tries to break up two Hebrew guys that are fighting. And they say, hey, you're going to kill us like you did that Egyptian. So he realizes someone saw him. Uh, Pharaoh finds out what he did. Moses goes and hides in the wilderness for 40 years. And uh, he's trying to flee the consequences. Mind you, he's trying to flee the consequences of the right heart, wrong behavior. Saw the right thing. That's not right. That's injustice. Something must be done. But he just chose the wrong route. He chose the wrong behavior. So he flees, flees to the wilderness, and, and I just, for 40 years, and I just choose to believe. I think it's not a stretch to say he grew up. Moses grew up some more. It says that originally he grew up when it says when he, grown, when he was grown. But I propose he grow, Moses grew up some more. And then we find a, a, an interesting passage of Scripture as the story goes on in, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. It says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt, Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. I want you to notice this. The cry, that came, the cry didn't make it to God because they were Israelites. The cry came to God because they were some of his creation in bondage. His creation was crying out, saying, this isn't right. Lord, help us. So God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel. And I want, this is a very powerful phrase. And if you don't get anything else out of today, get this phrase. And God acknowledged them. The first thing we have to do if we want to see change is we have to acknowledge other human beings. Acknowledge other human beings and acknowledge what they may be going through. Acknowledge how they feel. Acknowledge what they feel like they're going through, how they feel like they're being treated, how they are being treated, what they are going through. And God acknowledged him. He heard the cries of the slaves. He heard the cry of the people under oppression. I love this. God, in his wisdom, when he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to save these people, God found a man who he knew it was already in his heart to get rid of the injustice. And he goes and finds a man, Moses, who's been hiding in the wilderness for 40 years because he had a heart for justice, but he didn't have the wisdom to walk it out. He didn't have the wisdom to carry it out. So God found a man who had the same heart that he had, that this is not right. This is not how human beings should be treated. And you know how the story goes. God gets Moses, brings Aaron along on the journey, and Moses uh, gets a strategy from the Lord to deliver the children of Israel from their oppression, to deliver the children of Israel from their bondage. Exodus 3, 7, and the Lord said, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow, so I've come down to deliver them from the hands of the Egyptians. Now, I want to share something with you. We know about the ten plagues, and it's going to be really easy to think that the ten plagues were God's plan. But before there were ten plagues, God says, hey, go say this to Moses. Or I'm sorry, he says, God said to Moses, go say this to Pharaoh. Go tell him to let my people go. And if he doesn't do it the first time, now I'm going to, I'm going to give you some signs and some wonders to show him that you're working on behalf of God. He says, don't just deliver him because I'm telling you to. God told me to tell you, deliver my people. So it was God's plan. It wasn't Moses' plan. It was God's plan to deliver the people of Israel. And God empowered Moses with Aaron. Aaron's rod. He said, take Aaron, take your rod, throw it down. I'll turn it into a serpent. And then Pharaoh says, oh, really? I got people that can do that. Some of his magicians come and throw their serpents down. And love this. Aaron's, Aaron's serpent ate their serpents. It's like, okay, I can do that. Oh, yeah? And it's almost like the Lord, he didn't even prepare Aaron for this one. He's like, yeah, if you'll throw your rod down, I'm going to turn it into a snake. They'll love that one. Throws it, turns into a snake. The others turn into a snake. Aaron's rod, the snake, eats the others. Can you picture Aaron? He's like, ooh, didn't see that one coming. I thought the snake thing would work in the first place, but I did not see that snake eating them other snakes. There's, that's a lot of snakes. 
What an incredible thing to see, to have to watch. And yet Pharaoh watches this. Something very clear. It should have been clear. This is God speaking. It should be clear. This is God speaking. But in his pride and in his, and in his desire to maintain control, Pharaoh said, nope, not going to do it. Not going to let these people out of slavery. Not going to treat them like human beings. Not going to let somebody else come in here and tell me that I've been wrong. Not going to let somebody in here come in here and tell me how I'm supposed to think. The exact sentiment of so many people, particularly on Facebook and other social media platforms. They post their counter, their, 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 their counter thoughts and their counter ideas so that they don't have to acknowledge other human beings. They don't have to admit they could be wrong. Let me say it this way. Plagues, this, this should have been easy. When, when, God, when, when God sent Moses and Aaron to tell them, say, hey, let these people go, it should have been easy. Slavery is wrong. Just don't do it anymore. Slavery's wrong. Don't do it anymore. Wasn't. So what, what happens? Signs and wonders and miracles don't work. In come the ten plagues. Let me say this. Plagues were not the plan of God. Plagues were the pressure of God to ensure justice for all. I'll say it again. Plagues were not the plan of God. Plagues were the pressure of God to ensure justice for all. When men don't listen to God the first time, he's so gracious, he's so merciful. He was, Pharaoh was fixing to get a get-out-of-jail-free card. Hey, no, no harm, no foul, let them go. No punishment, no death, no plagues, no nothing. It's called grace. It's the God we serve. It's called mercy. You don't have to pay for what you've done. But I know this about God. As gracious and as merciful as he is, he is equally just. And he will... Before it's all said and done, he will have and he will create. He will create a pathway for justice for all. This is, this is going to blast some of your theology. What if what we're dealing with today is not the plan of God, but the pressure of God to get justice for all? What if for hundreds of years in the United States of America, we haven't been listening we haven't been asking the questions we're supposed to ask. We haven't been having the conversations that we're supposed to have. And what if this is just the very next step? And you say, I, Pastor Braden, you're, you're, uh, you're siding with the looters? You're siding with the anarchists? You, are you Antifa? No. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll share T.D. Jakes just to make this a little easier for some of you. Wrong is wrong. Moses had a good heart and with a wrong behavior. Some of the people, some people in what they're doing, Steve, I'm not even saying they have a good heart. Wrong behavior is wrong behavior. But can we not just acknowledge that maybe the heart was right, just the behavior was wrong? And can we not just acknowledge that maybe that the Lord's allowing some of this stuff to happen to put a little pressure on some of us that need to go, hang on a second. Have we missed something? I'm having conversations with my kids right now that I've never had before, that I probably would have never had had the news not been constantly streaming protests. And I'm having to explain to my kids why they're protesting. And I'm having to explain to my kids why people are protesting what they're protesting. These are conversations that are probably years overdue. These plagues come to the, to the, to, to the Egyptians. And if you'll notice, they start off pretty subtle. They start off pretty small. First one's turning, turning the river into blood. And then you get darkness, and, you, and I'm not in the right order, I'm sure. Darkness and locusts and the cattle die. And here's what's interesting. The pressure kept getting worse until they literally lost their firstborn sons. Can I just say this? I believe with all of my heart that God's going to have justice. He's going to get his justice. And he will deliver his oppressed people from their bondage and from their slavery. And I don't want it to take ten plagues to get me to listen. I don't want it to take 10 plagues for the United States of America, for the world to say, okay, <laughs> clearly we've missed it. I don't, I'm not even going to pretend to prophetically know what stage we're in as a church. Are we, in, are, we, are, we when, are we in the stage where the Lord's just asking us to change? Are we in the stage where he's doing signs, wonders, and miracles? Is this the first plague? I'm not even going to pretend. I think we all can agree we don't like what we're living in and that what we're living in is not God's plan. 
What if in this economic, let me say it a different way, what if in this global reset through the economic crisis, the, the coronavirus pandemic, with this thing that we prophetically know is God hitting the reset button, what if one of the things he's saying, okay, here's another thing we're going to deal with, because doesn't it seem like the perfect storm right now? Can we just be honest? It seems like what can go wrong seems like it is going wrong. Maybe it's so that what can get right needs to get right right now. What if this is God saying, I've allowed some things to happen to take place to get the attention of my people to say, hey, stop. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Turn from your wicked ways and I will heal your land. Heal your land. This country was founded on the wicked ways of slavery. And who am I to decide how long it takes for generations of sin to get out of the hearts and souls of people? Who am I to decide how long that takes? Do I condone sin? Never will. My Bible says that sin is missing the mark. Sin is what Jesus came, sin is what put Jesus on the cross. The wages of sin is death. But is it possible that in this season, the Lord's saying enough is enough? Enough is enough. Two questions. I've already said it, but I just want to repeat them very clearly. This is how I'm going to close. What if we're in a season in this country, where what we're seeing is God-ordained pressure. What if he's letting this happen? What if this is, what if these are plagues trying to convince people that have been in the wrong to get in the right? What if? And the second question is, how much pressure will it take for you to repent? How much pressure will it take for you to repent? And this just isn't, this isn't just a message to white people. This is a message to all people. Because I'm not here to advance the kingdom of the United States of America. I'm here to advance the kingdom of God. And all of us belong to that kingdom. All of us have a role in that kingdom. And all of us need to feel the pressure to be on the right side of this thing. And if we're on the wrong side of this thing, if there's anything in our hearts that don't put us on the right side of this thing, it's time to repent. It's time to say, Lord, show me. Show me what I can learn. Show me who to listen to. Show me who to talk to. Show me areas in my life that need an adjustment in this area. I want to close by leading us in a, as a church, myself included, in a, a prayer of repentance. And I would just encourage you to bow your heads with me right now and just join me. Lord, we are, uh, I am at a loss for words sometimes and how to even go about one just living in this season, much less leading in this season. But I just come to you and say I repent. I repent for not, I repent for the sin of apathy. And I I repent for the sin of, and missing the mark in the area of not acting like this problem wasn't my problem because it didn't directly affect me. Little did I know that you had called me to affect affect the world around me for the sake of your kingdom. And if it's it's a problem for me, if it's a problem in your kingdom, and injustice is a problem in your, in your kingdom. It's not what your kingdom's about. So I'm just asking you, I'm asking for your forgiveness. If there's any area in my life, any area in my heart that still needs work, I'm asking you to work on it. Reveal it. Show us where you want us to improve. Show us where you want us to grow. Show us where you want us to change. And Lord, as leadership and as just believers, as people called to be salt and light on this planet, give us the wisdom. Give us the wisdom. I was so impacted last week when I read the scripture. It says, David dealt wisely. In a season when David was being oppressed, David dealt wisely. In a very tense situation, David dealt wisely. Lord, give us the wisdom. Show us what you would have us do in this season to align the kingdoms of this world with the kingdom of our God. In Jesus' name, amen.